Hey, good morning, Choice Residential. Hope your day's off to a great start. So today we are talking about the new revised version of the exclusive buyer agency agreement. This is the October 2024 revision. Uh, there's a 30 day grace period in order to start using this version of Form 201, the exclusive buyer agency agreement. Uh, so if you have a uh, previous version, uh, the previous version of the buyer agency agreement, uh, no worries, you don't have to replace that. Uh, but moving forward, you should begin using this new version, the October 2024 version. Great news. They have reduced our buyer agency agreement down from seven pages down to just three pages. So they have condensed a lot of the language, hopefully uh, with the intent of making it easier for you, the agent to understand, and most importantly, for the buyer to understand what they're signing. So this is a less daunting version of the buyer agency agreement. This will become our only version of the exclusive buyer agency agreement. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Take a look at what some of these changes were. Uh, first, we're going to uh, get in here for uh, paragraph one services provided. So again, uh, what they, the goal of this new version of the form was if it took two or three or four or even five sentences to explain something on the previous version, they wanted to condense that into one sentence. So uh, things that may have taken half a page to explain on the prior version, maybe just take one or two sentences now. Um, uh, and uh, things like the dual agency section that took a page and a half to explain, they've reduced it into just a paragraph or two. Uh, so when we talk about services provided, you're going to be entering here uh, the type and location of property that your buyer is gonna be looking for. Um, the type generally is going to be residential real estate, could be land, so you could specify in that respect as well. And then what's most important is the location. Um, it's not uncommon that we have buyers who are moving to North Carolina, but they might be considering Raleigh or Charlotte. And so they could be looking in both areas. So you want to make sure you're defining your agency agreement to um, contain just the locations that you would be working with this buyer to search for uh, property. So that might be central North Carolina. That might be Wake County. It might be Wake, Johnston and Durham counties. Um, whatever the location is, try to be fairly specific, um, but it could be if you actually service uh, Charlotte all the way to the Triangle or you service the Triangle all the way to Wilmington, um, it could in include a larger area, even the entire state of North Carolina. Just remember, you are expected by the Real Estate Commission to be competent in any market that you are working. So if you don't know anything about Charlotte or Charlotte real estate, you probably shouldn't be helping a buyer there. Um, so keep this specific. Uh, something like uh, Central North Carolina would be good. Probably could get away with uh, the Triangle region. I think that's a well-established enough uh, locale that something like that could work. Um, don't overthink it, but do be specific to what how you're going to be helping your client. Uh, and then, of course, it has reduced and explained what the services that we're providing that we're helping with uh, negotiating offers, contracts, uh, repairs, inspections, uh, scheduling appointments and tours and things like of that nature. So it does go in and explain in simple language uh, what we are doing for the client. All right, let's move down to paragraph two, the buyer disclosures. Um, so what we are trying to accomplish here is to find out, has this buyer engaged with another real estate agent? Remember, buyers could have non-exclusive agreements uh, with multiple agents. And in fact, there's nothing that would stop a buyer from signing multiple exclusive agreements. But we want to try to get to the bottom of this. Um, also recognizing that buyers may sign touring or showing agreements uh, with an agent. So literally just an agreement to allow them to go view a property. But we want to know that. So the uh, 2A is asking, has the buyer signed any document? So we're not we're not confusing the buyer with, have you signed an agency agreement or a showing agreement? Have they signed any document with another real estate agent or firm? And this includes signing uh, an order just to tour a property. Um, if they say yes to this, if they have looked at a property or signed something with another agent, then they are agreeing to give you that agent's contact information. This is important because if they've looked at another property and then they want to go see that property again with you, you might be in a situation where you could be working for free because that original agent may have a procuring cause claim and you may go through the whole transaction with the buyer close unbeknownst to you. They looked at that property prior to meeting you with another agent and that agent files a procuring cause claim goes to arbitration and you could actually uh, forfeit that commission that you earned um, so you want to have that information contact uh, be able to contact that agent to confirm did they did you show this buyer this property um, and that's just a situation it's unfortunate you may have to decide i just can't represent that buyer if they want to go see that home 
Um, that's probably the safest way to handle it. Or you may decide, hey, I'm going to reach out to this other agent and pay them a referral fee in order to just say, hey, sorry, this happened. Uh, as a professional courtesy, I'd like to offer you a, a referral fee if they decide to move forward, uh, go under contract and purchase this particular property. Um, or you again, you, you may uh, decide not to work with that buyer uh, so that you don't end up working for free. Um, then uh, B, are they working with a relocation company? Of course, you need to know that. And then have they received sample copies of the offer to purchase and uh, professional services? So make sure you are providing those documents and then having them check that they have received those. Um, paragraph three, the term of the agreement. This has gotten a little bit shorter. Uh, there used to be another section that said if the buyer was going to be buying multiple properties, check this box and this agreement will last until this date. That way, if you have an investor, for example, buying multiple properties, you wouldn't need to do multiple buyer agency agreements. They've removed that part. Um, and so now there is just a, uh, a date that you would put in here. And either when they close on a property or at this date, that's when the agreement expires. If you wanted to extend it to multiple properties, you can still do that. And the way you would do it, I'm going to scroll down here to the third page, uh, which is additional terms section. You can just simply write the language in here that says this agreement will be in effect until uh, December 31st of 2025 um, so that the buyer can purchase multiple properties within that window of time. Something along those lines. Since we're a party to the contract, we can modify it in that way. So on the rare occasions where you need or would like to have that type of language in there, just know you can still add it. All right, fee for services. Um, they've tried to simplify this as well. Uh, they recognize they had all these warnings and instructions for how agents are supposed to fill this out by putting in a specific amount and not a range, not zero, not NA, and yet agents would still do it. So their hope is that agents have learned by now since it's it's always been real estate license, North Carolina license law that you had to put a specific amount in there. But now that it's MLS rules as well, uh, they're hoping that agents understand that now due to all these this discussion about the NAR settlement. So they're hoping that without that, that added language that just lengthens the document that agents will understand how to fill this section out. So if you want to charge your buyer a non-refundable retainer, it will be credited towards the total compensation. You would just check this first box. This section is meant for check all that apply. Notice that. So you can check the non-refundable deposit and check the box that you're going to receive X percent of the gross sales price. And remember, this retainer would apply uh, towards that. So let me just give you a quick scenario here. Let's say you charged the buyer a thousand dollar non-refundable retainer, and then you're going to get paid two and a half percent of the gross sales price. If at closing the listing firm or seller are paying you two and a half percent, remember that thousand dollars goes towards that money. So you're receiving the full compensation from the seller or listing agent. You would need to credit that thousand dollars back. Yes, it's non-refundable, but remember, it's not a thousand dollars plus two and a half percent. Your total fee would just be the two and a half percent. And this member, it says here, it credits towards that total compensation. So um, just bear that in mind. If you are receiving a retainer fee uh, that does not give you permission to receive that amount on top of the total compensation, um, it is part of the total compensation. Uh, or if you want to do a flat fee, of course, you could do that here. There is a box for other specific amount. And so if you had some more complicated way that you were charging compensation, um, we could simply write it in here. Or if it's not enough room here, we could see uh, add something that says C attached compensation addendum. Um, and just as an example, I don't encourage you to do this. I think in, in, for the most part, you should be keeping this very simple, a percentage or a flat fee. Uh, but let's say that you wanted to have a compensation plan that said, if I show the buyer between zero and 10 properties, my compensation is 2%. Between 11 and 50 properties is going to be 2.5%. And more than 50 properties is 3%. You could create an addendum that spells all of that out. That can create much more complication than it's probably worth. Uh, just know that that's an option and always talk to me uh, or leadership um, before venturing off on that kind of creative compensation planning. Um, and then there's some additional details here. So when is the fee earned, due, and payable? Um, you know, once the buyer goes under contract, uh, the fee has been earned and is due or payable when they either look at this last little section here, this last sentence, when they close or default on the contract. So if the buyer closes on the contract, that's when it's due and payable. Or if they default on the contract. So if the buyer breaches their purchase contract, uh, then, then they would still owe you the commission. So keep that in mind. 
breach of contract is buyer terminates after the due diligence period has ended. For the seller, the seller can't sue the buyer over that. They're just going to keep the due diligence fee and earnest money. But there's the implication of the buyer actually owes your compensation, the firm's compensation. So there is often a strategy if there is no earnest money that agents will uh, have no due diligence period. Um, that's okay, except keep in mind, if you are encouraging the buyer to do that, then don't plan to go after them for your compensation if they breach the contract, if they terminate, because you coached them into not having a due diligence period, meaning if they decide not to buy the house, they are going to be in default on day one. Um, if you then tried to sue them or go after them for the compensation, that may not play out well. So just know, though, if a buyer does breach a contract in a traditional, normal sense, there was a traditional due diligence period they investigated, but then they breached the contract later. Uh, the compensation is due and payable. Uh, seller and listing firm assistance here. This just says that while we may seek our compensation from the seller or listing firm, they're under no obligation to agree to that. So this is just a reminder to the buyer that they are agreeing to pay you whatever fees you outline up here. Uh, mutual termination required. Uh, this is paragraph 4C. Um, this just explains that while, look, we can't stop a buyer from going and signing an agreement with another firm. So they sign this exclusive agreement with us and then they go sign one with somebody else that they, uh, unless we mutually, unless we also agree to terminate our agency agreement, they still may, may be on the hook to pay us our compensation if they go buy a house with another agent. So this spells that out for them there. And then of course, our protection period uh, that prevents uh, buyers and sellers from colluding to eliminate their agents. Um, that protection period is still in play in this agreement. Of course, the new language here about fees are negotiable and additional compensation uh, above and beyond what we put in paragraph four, buyer has to agree to. So you would either amend this agreement, let's say you had two and a half percent in this agreement and a seller is offering you 3% or a builder is offering you 3%. You could either use form 710 to amend this agreement or you could, uh, in, in most cases, you'll be using a form 220 in which the buyer is going to acknowledge and consent to you receiving the fee outlined on that form 220. So if that 220 says 3%, that is sufficient where the buyer is giving you permission to receive it. All right, paragraph six, the dual agency. So if you remember on the original buyer agency agreement, it was about a page and a half to, um, uh, to explain dual agency. It was way too complicated. Um, they did uh, consolidate it here. Um, they think they have made it less complicated. I'm not so sure, but it is certainly, it is less complicated. Um, uh, may still be room for improvement, but here's the main thing I want you to know. Keep in mind that at, at Choice, we ask that all clients agree to designate a dual agency. And the reason is any client who understands what that means, that would be their preference. They don't want to eliminate all the choice listings that are available. So they don't want exclusive representation. Um, and there is no reason not to have designated dual agency with our firm because uh, chances are you as a buyer's agent are not going to know anything about that seller. You're not going to have any information that would prevent you from being able to be a designated dual agent. And most clients would want their listing agent to continue representing them and their buyer agent to continue representing them separately and still be able to offer advice. So they want designated dual agency as long as they know what it means. So we ask that all of our buyers and all of our sellers agree to it. That's our, our firm policy. So the way you accomplish that really is the same as on the original form. The first set of initials here is that they are giving you permission. The seller or the buyer is giving you permission to act as a dual agent in the transaction. Okay. Next blank is okay. If firm may act as a dual agent. So if a, a client, if a buyer is initialed up here, which we are going to ask that all of our buyers do, um, if they've initialed up here, then they can initial these as well. Buyer authorizes the same agent to represent buyer and seller. Well, that's up to you and your client. In most cases, it's better not to represent both of them. Uh, but if there's a situation where that is going to happen, um, then you know that's allowable. Uh, most agents would say, uh, in my experience, that they will not represent the buyer and seller in the transaction. So the buyer just will not initial this. In the old version of the form, there was a checkbox. It was yes or no. Here, you just don't have them initial it. Okay. 
And then the third box is, is the buyer directing the firm to be a designated dual agent? And yes, we want them to, we're asking all buyers to agree to designated dual agency. So the way you're going to have your buyer clients fill this out 99.9% .9 of the time is initial this first set of blanks and initial the third set of blanks. And then you may initial the middle set if the buyer is agreeing to let you represent both sides. Okay. But remember, if, if you represent both sides, obviously you're not a designated dual agent. You can't be at that point. You can still initial this because you don't know at this state of the, at this stage of the game, you don't know if you're going to be in, in a situation where you would represent the buyer and seller. Um, so as long as you're not, you can still be behaving as a designated dual agent. But 99.9% .9 of the time, first blank, third blank. We have to disclose all material facts. Um, and if we uh, do become a dual agent, buyer waves, claims, damages, losses, expenses, etc. Uh, due to us uh, acting as a dual agent uh, legalese that still remains in the contract for our protection. Uh, paragraph seven, again, they consolidated what was multiple paragraphs into one smaller, easier to read paragraph. Um, talks about surveillance, photographs, and video. Uh, buyer has the right to uh, seek other professional advice, including an attorney to review this agreement if they would like. Uh, paragraph nine talks about inspection costs and that even if the buyer terminates the contract and doesn't close, uh, they're still going to be responsible for paying uh, for any inspections. Um, confidentiality, we won't disclose terms of a contract, but we can't prevent uh, the seller or listing firm from disclosing terms of the contract. Uh, wire fraud warning, they tried to make it a little less abrasive and harder to read, but they still made it red uh, lettering here. To, it's the only color on this document. So uh, hopefully buyers will recognize it's an important paragraph to understand. Um, and then paragraph 12, of course, any additional terms that we want to add and then the rest of it is, again, legal language that we want in there. And then that's it, signature page. So we're down to three pages for our buyer agency agreement. Um, I strongly encourage you to read this word for word 10 times. Every document you should read 10 times to make sure that you completely understand uh, the language in there and that if you do have questions, you're able to get clarity on it before you're trying to explain it or answer questions to a client. So hopefully this was helpful to go through this. Uh, and if you do have other questions, please do not hesitate to reach out so we can make sure you have clear understanding. All right, until next time, take care.